Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a virtual Howard University. My name is Professor Japa Dawuni, an Associate Professor of Political Science and the Founding Director of the Howard University Center for Women, Gender, and Global Leadership. My sincere apologies for the um, late um, start because we had a technical issue, but I promise you it's going to be worth every minute you spend with us today. So as we know, today is March 2nd, and it's the uh, second day of the Women's History Month. And this is going to be Howard University's sixth celebration of International Women's Day, but a second celebration under the new Center for Women, Gender, and Global Leadership. And we are so excited to have an excellent panel of Black women diplomats who are going to share their experiences and encourage us as we continue to push forward to break the biases. So I would like to also encourage our audience that please make sure you use the Q&A box when it comes to questions to engage with our audience. I'm also excited to announce that this morning at Howard University, an announcement went out which indicated that the Center for Women, Gender and Global Leadership has received another gift from Pivotal Ventures, a Melinda French Gates company to support the work we're doing. And we are very excited and we continue to welcome partners who will support the work. I'm excited to say that this money that has been given is going to push forward the agenda to engage in research that would ground the experiences of black women. And I'm excited to announce that with, in line with the topic for today, I co-authored a piece last year with a Howard University PhD candidate in the political science department, Constance Troa, on the paucity of black women in international diplomacy. And we are hoping that with this new gift, we are going to engage in research that looks at black women in diplomacy and also other areas. So I encourage everyone who is interested in the topic to read more. And also if you haven't, and this is not it is gonna come as a surprise to Ambassador Ilan Thomas, but if you haven't already, get a copy of her book and it's called Diversifying Diplomacy. I got this book before I got to meet her and I'm just making a pitch out of my own. Apologies, Ambassador Ilan Thomas, because I didn't discuss this with you. So without much ado, I would like to welcome to the podium Howard University's Chief Operating Officer, Dr. Tashini Andubroy, to give remarks from the university. Dr. Andubroy, the uh, Tashini and Dubroy, the my virtual microphone is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dooney, for such a warm welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm extremely excited because we've entered a month where we go above and beyond to celebrate women, our accomplishments, our resilience, our everyday impact, and strength. We've got so much work to do, but let us not be overwhelmed by what's left to be accomplished that we forget the milestones that we've already achieved. VP Kamala Harris is in the premier seat in the White House. We are proud of our bison. Judge Katanji Brown will soon be a newly minted as a Supreme Court Justice. That's cause for celebration. I'll admit, women at large and Black women in particular have a long way to go. We have a lot of firsts that we haven't yet conquered nationally and globally. And there are times when I learn of inaugural accomplishments that women have secured, and I find it so unbelievable that in 2022, we're still able to title women as the first to be decorated in their academic and professional fields. Why haven't the opportunities been granted to women prior to this? And more specifically, why haven't Black women been recognized for their contributions and smarts? Why are we being kept down and held back? We are joined by two of the nation's most distinguished voices in foreign diplomacy, Ambassador Elam Thomas and Ambassador Spratlin, who certainly honor us with their presence and expertise this morning. Breaking barriers and biases are the topics for our discussion, but as I'm sure our diplomats will share, the goal is not only about breaking barriers, but also about creating opportunities, exceeding expectations when we're in positions of leadership and leaving the door open for other women to follow. I want to talk to you about the burden women in leadership often carry in silence. When a man fails in his position of leadership, there is often no worry about whether or not the door will remain open for another man to succeed him. Men fail and they're forgiven. But when a woman fails in her position of leadership, 
we collectively wonder whether another woman will ever be allowed into the room. That shouldn't be the case. Women should not have to lead in fear of failure. Failures strengthen leaders. It is through these failures that we gain experience and grit. The system has to be reformed so that our gender is not penalized for the missteps of one person. The same rings true for Black women. VP Harris is a pioneer. Her presence should catalyze the opportunity for more Black women to join her. And it is up to us and our allies to ensure this is the reality. Our esteemed director for the Center of Women, Gender, and Global Leadership, Dr. Dawuni, published in recent years about the disparate, disparate numbers of women of color in ambassadorship. As of 2021, just 54 Black women have served in this capacity in the more than 2,300 people to have worked as, as U.S. ambassadors. Much of that history echoes within a context of covert racism and discrimination. So in any given discussion, you're looking to the last 50 to 60 years when someone could have argued that opportunity was available, but not yet captured by Black people or Black women. That is an argument that could be continued today and at any point in history, it could be regarded as unreasonable and racist at its roots. Today, we will also look at the ways in which communities can find a greater foothold in seeing and grasping possibilities for all people, but specifically Black girls and women. How do we expand the prism of professional development and scholastic training so that young girls see linguistics, foreign affairs, military and economics as careers that are accessible and as rewarding as any other. Increasing the pool of talent begins with the building of exposure, interest, and support. That is the role of, of institutions like Howard University, conversations like the one we're about to have today, and people like you create. Like you, I look forward to the conversation, building ideas for our university and community in doing our part to prepare a cadre of double voices and leadership that reflects the people and the conscience of the world as we know it. Ambassador Spratlin, Ambassador Elam Thomas, our Board of Trustees, President Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, our students, faculty, and staff are proud to host you. Howard University is proud of its continuing leg legacy of leadership and groundbreaking impact in everyday fields of human endeavor. And today's dialogue is a chapter in that great history. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Dr. Dawuni, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tashni and DeBroy for those wonderful remarks. I would hand over the virtual microphone to Howard University politi political science major, Amin Haley Selassie, who is going to introduce our esteemed panelists. Amin, over to you. Hello, everyone. So today we are joined by Ambassador Harriet Elam Thomas, who is a retired diplomat. Some of her career accomplishments include serving as U.S. Ambassador to Senegal from 1999 to 2003, Chief of Mission to Guinea-Bissau, Acting Director of USIA, Cultural Attaché at the American Embassy in Athens, Country Affairs Officer for Greece, Turkey, and Cyprus, Director of the American Press and Cultural Center, American Consulate in Istanbul and Turkey, and in other positions at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations, the President's Appointments Office at the White House and the Foreign Service Personnel Office. Ambassador Elam Thomas's additional posts were abroad in France, Mali, and the Ivory Coast. From 2003 to 2005, Ambassador Elam Thomas was the diplomat in residence at the University of Central Florida and stayed on to create a new diplomacy program. She retired from the University of Central Florida in 2021. Ambassador Harriet Elam Thomas is also the recipient of numerous awards, including the U.S. Government Superior Honor Award, the Lois Roth Award for Excellence in Informational and Cultural Diplomacy, and a Group Superior and Meritorious Honor Award for her work in connection with the first Persian Gulf War. We are honored to have Ambassador Harriet Elam Thomas as one of the inaugural members of the Global Council of Leaders at the Howard University Center for Women, Gender, and Global Leadership. Ambassador Pamela Spratlin served as a career member of the Foreign Service for nearly 30 years. Ambassador Spratlin was formerly Senior Advisor 
of the Office of Inspector General in the U.S. State Department Inspect Inspections Division. She was the U.S. Ambassador to Uzbekistan from 2015 to 2018 and Ambassador to the Kyrgyz Republic from 2011 to 2014. She has also served as the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Kazakhstan from 2009 to 2011. Ambassador Spratlin also served in Russia, in Moscow and Vlad Vladivostok, France um, in the U.S. mission to the OECD, and Latin America in Guatemala and the U.S. mission to the Organization of American States. Ambassador Spratlin's senior Washington assignments include her roles as the Director of Western European Affairs from 2007 to 2008, Director of Central Asian Affairs from 2006 to 2007, Acting Deputy Assistant for uh, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Central Asia from December 2007 to May 2008, and Special Assistant to the Counselor of the State Department from 2005 to 2006. She was a fellow and diplomat in residence at the East West Center in Honolulu in 2004 to 2005. Ambassador Spratlin has received numerous awards, including the Meritorious and Superior Honor Awards at the State Department. And without further ado, I'm handing it over to Ms. Hope to kick off our discussion for today. Thank you so much, Amen, for that uh, introduction of our esteemed guests this morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Tania Hope. I am the director of the Ralph J. Bunch International Affairs Center here at Howard University. And it is my pleasure to join you all today um, to engage all of us in what I know to be, will be a very interesting conversation. Uh, I am grateful to Dr. Dawuni for the invitation to participate in this and grateful for her leadership of the Center for Women, Gender and Global Leadership and her continued partnership with the Bunch Center um, over the years. Uh, it's always been a pleasure to participate in this event for the last six years. And I know that today's event will be as wonderful as the previous five. So <clears throat> with that, we can go ahead and get started. I will mention, however, at the Bunch Center, um, we, uh, we run the Patricia Roberts Harris Fellowship Program. And I just wanna mention that because Patricia Roberts Harris, a distinguished alumni of Howard University, was the first black female ambassador of the United States to Luxembourg, appointed by President Lyndon Johnson. And I just wanted to lead that off uh, as we begin this conversation because I'm not sure many people know about her. And I wanted to make sure that the Howard University community in particular was aware of the, the trails that we've blazed at this institution. Um, and, uh, and let you know that we have that fellowship available for Howard University students because uh, Ambassador uh, Roberts Harris felt that she wanted to provide an opportunity for Howard University students to be able to participate in internships that typically are unpaid so that, so that our students would have that practical experience and be able to do that networking she left a, a part of her estate and endowment to fund those types of uh, opportunities for our students. So we just selected our next cohort for this year. So next year, students at Howard, please make sure you inquire about that opportunity for both domestic and international internships. So with that, uh, I've met with our two guests already. We've had a conversation about how this wonderful conversation is going to go. And they've prepared some opening remarks, so I'm going to invite Ambassador Elam Thomas to please get us started. Might help if I turn this on. Greetings and thank all of you for such a warm welcome and lifting us, just seeing you and knowing that you are genuinely concerned about opening that aperture for so many of the young women we have met in our time to careers that they may not have thought about many years ago. You mentioned, as we discussed informally, how we might begin and what inspired us to become involved in foreign affairs. So I will tell you that as an exchange student in my junior year at Simmons College, my eyes were open to a world that I had no idea existed. 
It was the first time someone said to me, la jeune noire, comme elle est belle. Now, growing up in Boston in the 60s, early 60s, no one had said that outside of my family. It was amazing to see how well informed all of my counterparts were. They were only 18 and 19 years old at the time. And they knew as much, if not more, about US history than I knew myself at that time. They respected their elders, their traditions, and they were not concerned about ephemeral things. They understood the tragedy of war because they were surrounded by reminders. And again, they're very young. Many were Lyceans where our group were all college students. They were fluent in more than one language because they traveled across borders just by virtue of being in Europe. So if we go to North Carolina, we might need a new accent, but we certainly didn't have to learn a new language. I also felt comfortable because I wasn't defined by the color of my skin. There was a genuine interest in my family and what we did, what was important within that unit that they had not seen. And I felt based on my brief observations of them that I wanted to change the misperceptions that they had about America and about women and minorities and the one way to do that would be to work abroad. That was my inspiration. Wonderful, thank you so much, Ambassador Spratlin. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation today and for this wonderful program. It's rare to be in a Zoom uh, context where we have all a uh, beautiful, African-American female faces of many generations. And it's a great pleasure to be here um, this morning. I'd like to uh, congratulate Dr. Dawuni on the um, re reception of this new award, this new donation uh, that's going to make some research possible at the center. The center's work is groundbreaking and vital. And so it's very important um, that you have received that. And I wish you the very best um, with it. Uh, You've invited us here to talk about the contributions of women in general and black women US diplomats in particular. And I just, I'm pleased that you mentioned Patricia Roberts Harris. And I, I hope along the way, we will note that uh, there are too few, but there are some very distinguished uh, African-American female diplomats. And it's a great pleasure to be on the same program with Ambassador Elam Thomas, who's done so much to pave the way uh, for me and uh, many others. And um, my hope is that the young men and women in the audience will be inspired by this because um, you know, Howard is playing a very, very important role and we need it to keep, keep stepping up and keep doing it. We haven't yet mentioned the signature programs here uh, for uh, the development of the diplomatic pipeline, the Payne Fellowship for USAID, the, P the Wrangell, and the Pickering Fellowships um, that are focused on the State Department, but people take those many different places. All of those programs, as I understand it, are celebrating anniversaries this year. And I'm delighted that Howard is going to be um, taking that up and shining a, a very positive light on those programs that are uh, doing such great work to build our badly damaged uh, pipeline of new talent in going into the Foreign Service. Let me just turn uh, briefly, since we had such a lovely uh, recitation of our careers, I'd just like to say that for myself, uh, I would say that there was no defining moment, which was your question that told me that I should go into foreign affairs. Instead, I would say that um, first and foremost, I have to give great credit to my parents, uh, Dr. Lois Price Spratlin and Dr. Thaddeus Spratlin. Um, they are not with us any longer, but the legacy that they left is really tremendous. And one of the things that they did, they were strivers of the, of the sort that Isabel Wilkerson talked about in her masterwork, The Warmth of Other Sons. They were both from the South. They moved North and West as the last person that she chronicled in uh, Isabel Wilkerson chronicle in her, her book did. And one of the messages to myself and my four siblings from that was that moving from where you are to another place physically 
to seek an opportunity is a good thing. It's expected and probably necessary for you to make your way in the world and pursue your dreams. So that was something that just by virtue of the fact that our family moved from Ohio to Washington State to a small teacher's college um, was one of the early nudges that said to me, you need to do something special or unique to soar. But I would sort of divide the inspiration into two parts. The first would be this idea of seeds planted, the way my parents approached the idea of striving. Another seed planted uh, was uh, the fact that I learned French as a child. My father was a professor at a teacher's college in uh, Northwest Washington State. And we had, it was an all white college, but uh, the French teacher was an African-American woman. And I know that her exuberance and her love of the language and the literature, um, even as a child was very inspiring and made an impression on me. So that was a seed planted. Another seed planted was that my parents were political activists and my father uh, started standing in a peace vigil to oppose the Vietnam War in the early, uh, fairly early to mid 60s. He did this with members of the Quaker community in our small town. That was uh, a way of bringing the world to us. We were very far up, tucked up near the Canadian border. And uh, there we were, my father was downtown every weekend with this peaceful protest. And I think the message was, we support justice. We need to stand for it. And we need to stand for it all over uh, the world. I think uh, another factor was the fact that my father in the 50s had tried to join the foreign service. Of course, uh, that was impossible at the time, almost. There were very, very few Black candidates at that time, and the bar was quite high. So that was not something that was possible for him, but it was something that I uh, knew about. So I would say those were all seeds planted. And then when I got to college, um, like Ambassador Elam Tom and I, Thomas, I also attended a women's college. I went to Wellesley and graduated in uh, 1976. It was a very heady experience to go there and to be with all of these supremely talented women. And I wanted to take the foreign service exam, but I never quite got myself up to the courage to do it at that time. Um, but that along with the fact that I wanted to join the Peace Corps uh, after, I, after my senior year, but couldn't uh, for health reasons, I had allergies and so I was not allowed to join the Peace Corps. And, but I told myself someday I would be involved in international affairs. So I would say those were all the seeds planted for me. And then after I graduated from college, worked for a while, and then graduated from the uh, public policy school at UC Berkeley, I was working in California at the California legislature, a very exciting time to be working in California politics. It's almost always an exciting time to be working in California politics. And I was working for the Assembly Ways and Means Committee, which is the committee that handles uh, the money and money policy. And I was working on higher education. I was over 30 at that point, and one day I remember seeing a lobbyist for one of the, um, the systems that, that we were working with, and he was looking very dejected, kind of shuffling shoulders over. He was an older white gentleman, but I said to myself, someday I could be him if I stay here. I don't want to be a lobbyist who stays too long or a person who stays too long in a situation that isn't fundamentally fulfilling. So let me reawaken my interest in international affairs. In 1987, I took the exam. And um, then I was, uh, it took a long time, a long and winding road. But in January of 1990, I became a foreign service officer. And I was thrilled because I wanted to uh, both travel. I wanted to learn about new cultures. And I wanted to see how far I could go as a representative of the United States of America. Was it possible I had the same concerns that this panel really addresses? Would the biases and would the barriers forbid me? Or was I there at a time of opportunity so that a career would be possible? And I'm happy to say that 30 years later, I had a wonderful career in the Foreign Service. Um, and I can talk a little bit about uh, what my, my tours, although you've heard some of them. But that was really the, the inspirational piece for me is those seeds that were planted along the way throughout my childhood and early uh, adulthood. And then that moment when I said, okay, if you don't do this now, you may never do it, so let's go. So um, let me stop there in terms of the introduction. And uh, just again, thank you for the invitation today. Thank you both so much. You both touched on points that we definitely try to lift up here at the Bunch Center. First, Ambassador Elon Thomas, the study abroad is definitely something that we've been working very hard to make sure that our Howard University students have an opportunity to participate in. And 
since I've been here, I think we've increased the participation rate over 300% of Howard University from where it was when I arrived. Um, of course, the pandemic has, has not been nice to us in that way, but we hope to get our students back out into the world very soon. And, and Ambassador Spratlin, your, and, and similarly, your, your mention of the movement, similar to study abroad, it's that moving out of your comfort zone to realize kind of where it is that you fit into this world that we live in. And also the language piece, which is something I personally feel very strongly about, our ability to communicate with people in their own language is so, so important. Um, and I definitely encourage our students to, to do more than the required four semesters of a foreign language while they're here at Howard. So thank you both for that. Um, Ambassador Elam Thomas, is there uh, any early career highlights um, that you'd like to share with us, particularly as a Black female in, in the Foreign Service? With pleasure. And each of them came with a challenge or two of being female and Black. I often said in my memoir that many times it was more difficult being a woman than being African-American. That's because we were in a very male-oriented institution. Uh, I will say that to, to go back a tiny bit, all of my high school counselors and junior high school counselors thought I should be in the commercial course. So like Pamela, she reminded me the importance of family. Uh, if it weren't for my siblings who were 18, 19, and 20 years my senior, I would not have been able to even be prepared to enter a college because I was in a track for the commercial course, not the academic track. Now that's a subtle way of weaning out women and people of color early on, which I think explains why we are so thrilled now that we have a few women in math and science. But um, the first question I was asked when I finished Simmons College with a degree in international business was, do you know how to type? And all women were often asked that question. And I was so angry with my mother insisting that I learn to type, but now I shall be, and take shorthand, that I'll be forever in her debt because it served me well sitting in the president's office of, of Senegal taking notes, the only thing shorthand in English and shorthand in French are not quite the same, but you learned to be able to navigate what was necessary to be able to write that potent message back to Washington. Um, I often say that my time in Greece was really very special because I learned a language that the teachers just thought I shouldn't learn and they put, one professor put his hand on my shoulders and said, we want you to succeed. I felt it was patronizing. I was 42 years old and I did not appreciate that approach to me. So I was determined after that approach that I was gonna ace that language and I did. But I will say that I made the cardinal error and sin, so to speak. I overshadowed my boss the time I was in Greece for four years. Too much public persona. People knew that the cultural attaché missed one of the 17 exhibits that took place every week. And if your picture, you had something called high visibility. So you're the only black person at these receptions. This is before Greece had a black a woman who was on the city council, who was originally from Boston, by the way. This was in 1983 through 87. And because I was had such a high profile, enjoyed being able to interact with the intellectuals, the members of the Greek Academy. Imagine a little woman of color sitting next to the South African ambassador at the home of members of the Greek Academy who would just learn Greek and was scared to death whether or not she was gonna get through the evening and found that anyone of that level who's been well-educated is taught to speak French. Well, I was far more comfortable in dealing with the South African ambassador and others, my Host, my seat partner was from South Africa. This is 83 to 87, before apartheid ended. I said, I have to prove to him that we don't eat people. His perception of Americans or anyone of color is that we are I really, are people who really do strange things. Uh, I felt that that 
experience stands out in my mind. The mere fact that the ambassador asked me to go in his stead gave me that opportunity to deliver a message. Uh, the respect that I gave to the Greeks and Turks, because as you mentioned, um, Tonilla, speaking their language, in so doing, you give respect to their culture, to their history, to their traditions. There's nothing more gratifying than to see the tension diminish when you speak to someone and say, and even if that's all you can say, you've broken a barrier, you've given respect to them, you've tried. And to think that I was able to give speeches in French, not French there, Greek and Turkish about Blacks in science, technology, and education every Black History Month. I refused to talk about people in sports and entertainment. They didn't need to hear that. So my effort each time in both those settings, four years in Greece and four years in Turkey, was to deliver that message as well. I remember when I was not going to go to Greece, you talk about highlights, after I started studying Greek on my own, because the Department of State had lifted the requirement that no one who was in and of a culture to go, could go to that country. A Greek American wanted very much to be the cultural attitude. He got the position. I was devastated and I was brought to the counselor of USIA, never knowing that 28 years later, I'd be the counselor myself and told, we can't do this. Uh, wouldn't you like to go to the Cameroons? It's the Switzerland of Africa. I said, I've been in Africa for four years. I don't need to go, to, and I've been to Switzerland and, and the Cameroons to my knowledge is not the Switzerland of anything, it's the Cameroon. But I can tell you that it was really devastating to know that after all that effort, I was not going to be able to have an assignment that I looked so forward to have. But there is always a higher power. And through a somehow a fluke, the pre press attache left his position and the Greek American moved into that. So therefore I was able to go on and be cultural attache and not get promoted for four years because I overshadowed my boss. Mm -hmm. I know that now. That's a story for later, but that's enough in terms of interesting highlights. Wow, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Spratland, any highlights you'd like to share? Well, I have many, but um, because we're talking about this intersection between um, race and gender, mm -hmm. I want to start in 1999 when I was the, um, I had left Paris and I was at the, in the executive secretariat of the State Department. The executive secretariat is the nerve center of the State Department with messages uh, coming in, world leaders wanting to communicate with the secretary. Uh, and other senior officials in the department. And it's also the place where her trips are prepared uh, so that she's going out. So messages in and the secretary's visits out. So I was on the team that was preparing uh, her visits out and I was assigned to go to Moscow in uh, January of 1999. Now the relationship with Russia um, is often fraught and it was certainly fraught in January of 1999 over the issue of Serbia and many other things. And uh, the secretary, who was Secretary Albright at the time, wanted to go to Moscow in the middle of the winter to say, we want to engage with you. And so my job was to prepare the visit sort of operationally. Of course, I didn't have a policy role at that time. I was a mid-level officer, but I did have the sort of technical responsibility for making sure everything was in order in a country that can make things difficult for you, as we are now learning on, on many different levels, including on operational levels. Um, so I went to do this and uh, I got there and the secretary's visit uh, against many expectations ended up being a very successful one, at least in terms of everything going very, very smoothly. And I was able to do a couple of things that surprised some people um, in order to make sure that she uh, was met on arrival by the press, for example, um, when she was going to a very special airport. So at the end of it, the uh, deputy chief of mission, the number two in the embassy at that time, uh, John Teft and the ambassador, Jim Collins, uh, both were interested and several other people who were in the embassy at that time. 
asked me, Ambassador Teft called me on the day I was supposed to be leaving and said, uh, we would like for you to consider um, having a tour here in Moscow. Now, I am a child of the Cold War. I, you know, listen to all the same anti-communist propaganda, the same civil defense drills as everybody else of my generation. And I can remember being um, impressed, not, not impressed in a positive sense, but just the, the nature of what we were hearing did make an impression on me. I remember when I was very small, maybe nine years old, seeing this film of this woman who was blonde going into a grocery store and this giant red wave that was representing communism was coming over her. So we were told in lots of ways to fear Russians and to see them as the enemy. And as a child of Cold, the Cold War, we were now in 1999 and the, the USSR had collapsed in 1991. Um, and I, of course, the process had started earlier than that. And I thought to myself, this is an opportunity for me to do several things. I knew that I didn't want to work in uh, the Latin America Bureau where I had been before, but where I did not see much representation of uh, black women, in fact, I didn't see any, in uh, senior positions. Nobody who was an office director, you know, leading the affairs of a particular country, uh, nobody who was a deputy chief of mission that I know about, knew about, and nobody who was an ambassador. And I think even to this day, I hope to be corrected, uh, even to this day, we have not had a black woman uh, ambassador in the Spanish or Portuguese parts of the Western Hemisphere Affairs Bureau. And we now have, uh, fortunately, a very talented African-American assistant secretary who is the person who's head of the whole bureau. And my, my hope is that that will change. But at my time in the, in the 90s, I could see that this was just not a place of opportunity. So to be asked by the deputy chief of mission in a place that really mattered deeply to the United States to consider a position there, um, to know that that meant that I would have to learn Russian uh, but I was ready for that. I thought, okay, this is a good challenge. It opens up a lot of opportunity. And again, the message I got very early in life, you may need to travel and get out of your comfort zone in order to access uh, opportunities. And this is something that I'm really curious about. It matters to every single person what happens in this country and our relationship with it. So let me go and see what I can do. So I spent uh, the 11 months learning Russian and I attained the score that I needed to. Um, in the Russian language program. And then I went to Moscow and my first position was a kind of um, a countrywide one that required me to work to try to build small business and small business connections, uh, especially in the far east of Russia between the United States and the West Coast. That was conceivable at that time. And there was a very powerful Senator, uh, Ted Stevens of Alaska, who set aside money to make things like that uh, happen. So I took this position. I was responsible for uh, managing remotely at that time um, four young men who were contractors in different parts of the Russian Federation. And uh, it gave me an opportunity to do something that most of my colleagues in Moscow never got to do, which is travel in the country. So I didn't stay in the embassy in Moscow the whole time. I was able to go to Nizhny uh, Novgorod. Um, which is a very interesting part of uh, Russia. I was also able to go to the Urals, to Samara, uh, and out to Tomsk, which had formerly been a closed city, and all the way out to Vladivostok. And so it just gave me a feel for the country that very, very few people would have had. Now, just going back to the deputy chief of mission, who was the one who asked me, I once had a chance later to ask him why he had made this offer to me. And he said, that he had been very impressed. He worked with um, Ambassador Andrew Young at one point, and that had been his education about the importance of representation, the importance of bringing people in to do things that might not have been done before. And so um, that was part of the reason that, and I think also just they were, they were pleased with the job that I had done. And so I just, the, the point I would like to make is when you have an opportunity, take it, uh, do the very best you can with it, and it may be defining for you because what happened was that all of my overseas tours after that were in Russian speaking places. And so uh, it, it ended up being a very important moment uh, in my career. And it all happened because I happened to be assigned to Moscow to prepare this trip for Secretary Albright. It happened to go very, very well. Um, and then there was an individual who had a particular sensibility about diversity who asked me, and I wouldn't say it was only him, there were others in the embassy who felt the same way, 
And then I was able to take advantage of it. And so uh, there was that. And then when it came time, uh, the ambassador had changed by the time I was in Moscow, Sandy Virchbau, and they had had trouble staffing the consulate in Vladivostok. And so they needed to find a consul general and I raised my hand and I said, I would be happy to go. So again, uh, nobody came to ask me, but I said, this is an opportunity for me to step into leadership in a way that I never have. Is it the most isolated and remote place I could go? Probably so, but I'm glad I, I did. Um, it was an opportunity to speak Russian much more than I might otherwise have done. And we had had many years before an amazing consul general who went everywhere. His name was Randall Koch. And we, we had some fabulous uh, attorney uh, consuls general. And, you know, it was a, some were great, some were not so great. But um, what I was able to do, what he established was that we should travel throughout the Russian Far East. And so I continued that. And so I've been to Kamchatka, Magadan, to Birobidjan, to all these, to Yakutia, all these places uh, in Russia that many Russians had never been. And um, places that uh, I had a chance to see the diversity of Russia in terms of its people, in terms of its living conditions, its people's perceptions of their own lives. And so it was part of the reason I joined the Foreign Service. I wanted to travel, I wanted to go as many places as I could. And that experience was definitely a kind of out of time and place experience, but uh, it had many, many wonderful uh, moments in it. And I'm still in contact with some of the people, a few of the people uh, from Vladivostok at that time. But I would say that was a career highlight for sure. Wow, I mean, honestly, I could sit here and listen to both of you for hours on end easily. And I'm sure the feeling is shared among those listening. Um, so there are a number, I, I've scanned the who is, who is tuned in and I can see there are a good number of students in addition to Dr. Dawuni's class uh, that I know is watching. And so I'm, I'm wondering, we, Howard started an international relations major just a few years ago um, through our interdisciplinary program and the interest has skyrocketed. It's starting with about three or four students to now over a hundred students who have declared majors in international relations, which I think is absolutely phenomenal. Fabulous, yeah. What would you say to them in terms of perhaps what are some common misconceptions that people might have about a career in the foreign service and, and how, how might we be able to combat those misconceptions and, and communicate more effectively to for example, students at Howard University and other HBCUs that might be considering this career path. Ambassador Elam Thomas. Uh, first, I would say not to, to disregard um, your people who are your allies. John Teft, Pamela, was the president of the senior seminar and I was vice president. I went to Brussels because John Teft got on the phone and called the European area and said, you need to talk to this woman. So again, you see how I didn't know this, but I didn't know his connection with Andrew Young. So I've learned something that shows us we have another connection because I'll be forever grateful for having worked for Alan Blinken, who happens to be the secretary's uncle in Brussels. I would never have gone there if it weren't for John Tepp. In terms of young men and women who are considering this as a career, first of all, it is not all cocktail parties and receptions. It is dangerous. The time I was in Greece, four Americans had been killed by a terrorist group called November 17th. So again, having that high profile made it less fun. And they send a security team out to talk to the embassy staff and they tell you, take a low profile. Now I raised my hand three quarters of the way through the security briefing and said, so just tell me what, what do you think I should do to take a low profile? The man said, ah, I guess that would be, he's blonde haired, blue eyed. Uh, I guess that would be like me taking a, my taking a low profile in my way. I said, now you understand what it means to be here in this setting. So first of all, it isn't always easy. It's not as glamorous as movies has, have really portrayed you at these, men with a pinstripe striped suit and a boutonnier in their collar. No, no, it's hard work. And your successes don't always come while you're there. They may come two or three years down the road. There was nothing more gratifying than to go and see a human rights meeting in Senegal after I became ambassador and see on the stage men and women who had taken part 
one or two in a program that I had done there as the junior diplomat almost 30 years before. So it does take time. Learning also that you are not the only person or America is not the only kid on the block. Um, there are very few women in our business, but that is not to say that there will not be more. Nothing makes all of us happier than to watch Linda Thomas Greenfield every moment she takes that podium in New York. And from the time of her being the very first person in Biden's cabinet to be approved by the Senate said to me, we're, 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 we are making progress. I would say that it is important to any young man or woman to know their portfolios, what it is that he or she wishes to do. And once you do that, be able to express it on the printed page. If you are not an effective and concise writer, you will not have success in many careers, perhaps in business and marketing when you can do, what is the term, sound bites? But if you've got to write an analysis, you better be able to know how to highlight what is important, why you've stated it, and what impact it has on US foreign policy in country X, Y, or Z. That is something that requires time, but you can learn it. It's very different from academic writing. It's very different from poetic and liter literary writing, but it is important. I also would say that if in fact you think it is difficult to be separated from family, that all has ended thanks to the internet and digital communications. No one has to place a call to parent or family as I did for Easter or Christmas, two or three days in advance. This is 1965 when I was in Paris. Four days to make a call, a transcontinental call. Uh, I will stop here because our time is moving quickly and I want you to be able to get to the Q and A's. But those are just a couple of the highlights that come to mind in terms of being re realistic. What would I tell young men and women? At the end, I will give them the Aunt Harriet message, but not right now. <laughs> Great, we we'll look forward to that. Ambassador Spratlin. Um, well, I certainly would agree with many of the things that uh, Ambassador Elam Thomas has mentioned. I would just, just so we can again stay, uh, stay to our time, just say a couple of things. One, I think it's important to really know yourself and to know why is it that this career in the Foreign Service is of interest to you? Because this, the, the title of this panel is about biases and barriers, and both of those exist. There was just an event um, to commemorate uh, Ambassador Todman, a, a towering figure in uh, diplomacy in general and Af African-American diplomacy in, in particular, and to name the State Department's cafeteria after him. And why? Because he faced bias. He couldn't even eat his lunch when he first got started. Now, things have greatly improved and that isn't going to hap happen to you now, but it doesn't mean just because things have changed that there are no biases. Of course, we're human beings and there are biases that you will face. There are also barriers um, that you will face. I, you know, as I was getting ready to prepare for this, I went back to the, um, the General Accounting Office report that was done about, uh, about diversity in the State Department in 1989, the year before I joined State. And one of the recommendations was that the Secretary of State should analyze personnel processes for artificial barriers and eliminate any barriers found. And then you go to the report that was published by the same organization, the General Accounting Office in uh, 2020, based on data that they reviewed between 2002 and 2018, the GAO recommended that state take additional steps to identify diversity issues that could indicate potential barriers to equal opportunity in its workforce. So we hear the word barriers in 18, 1989 and in 2020. So we have you know, 30 years go by and we're still dealing with the same issue. So be realistic, there are barriers and there are biases. And th now I will say those will be, that will be true wherever you go to work. There's, there's no organization in the United States that is going to be immune from that. But I think what, what helps you is to be anchored in why you're there from the point of view of your own values your own goals, dreams, and ambitions. And so if this is something you wanna pursue, 
I can't guarantee that you're going to be able to achieve your dreams, but you should at least know what they are before you step into trying to get on that path of going into the forest, foreign service and competing in this up or out system, regardless of whether you're at the State Department, the Department of Commerce in their, in their foreign service, the Department of Agriculture or USAID. They're all up and out systems, meaning that if you don't get promoted in a certain period of time, you have to leave. So everybody's trying to move up that, that ladder, including you. And so making room for non-traditional people has been hard for the State Department, as you can see from what I just read about the General Accounting Office. So no, I think the, the key to that is knowing yourself, finding support systems, whether, and I think those support systems are much more developed now than they were uh, in the past, the Thursday luncheon group, or if you're, uh, you're Black, there are other groups for different, uh, communities uh, of diversity in the State Department, and this issue of family. Decide for yourself how this issue of family works for you. Uh, while I would agree with Ambassador Elam Thomas that we don't have to put requests for calls um, in a couple of days before we make them anymore, that time difference, that time difference and just physically being away from your family matters. It matters to your kids if you have them, it matters to your parents, your siblings. And it's important not to discount that. Yes, you can be there for, for key family events and so on, but day to day, you won't be there. And that has an effect on your relationships as we've all learned during this time of COVID where we might you know, not even be all that far away from each other, but we've still been isolated from one another. So I think that's an important thing uh, to remember. In addition to all the institutional issues that you have to deal with, the most important person you have to deal with is yourself. So know why you want to have this career and what the stakes are for you and what you're prepared to do to be excellent, do all of the things that Ambassador Elam Thomas said, but you're also a human being. And so how are you going to stay a human being true to yourself while you are pursuing one of the most amazing careers uh, that you could ever have? So over to you, Tania. Wonderful. So we have about half an hour left. I do wanna have some time for questions from the audience, but I do have, I'm gonna try to get one or two more questions in uh, before we we get to the questions from those who are tuning in. So um, if you could each speak a little bit to your own personal challenges that you've encountered navigating this field as a Black woman, and then <clears throat> share with us maybe one or two of your proudest accomplishments uh, as a diplomat. Ambassador Elam Thomas. Um, the challenges were always when you walked into a room, they weren't expecting you. They were expecting a male or if you were the country affairs officer and you walked in to report on the political, economic and um, cultural status of country X, you were really going to be the note taker. You were not gonna provide a substantive discussion of what had transpired in the past week in Greece, Turkey and Cyprus. That happened so often that I, I I had to learn not to let that bother me and just forge ahead with my reporting. Even to the point when I was acting director of USIA, I walk into a room with Strobe Talbot, with Tom Pickering, and they're sitting there awaiting my report on the last performing artist that came to the country, the countries with that where USIA then had programs. It was challenging. Um, it made me far more careful about what I did and before I opened my mouth, I don't do that as, as much now, but I knew that it might be misread if I said something that was not followed up by facts and research and polling and the reasons why we mounted one or another program in a particular country. I agree with Pamela, there is a deep sense of distancing even now. And for families who had children in high school, the worst thing was to have to move them that last two years in high school. So that is, that is a, a, an issue that we can't, the computers and the digital divide won't help us help a child deal with those developmental aspects in their junior and senior years in high school. But in terms of really frustrations, learning that there will be so many battles that you've heard this a thousand times, you have to pick them and choose them. 
find an ally. If I didn't have the Ed Perkinses, who were the director generals of the Foreign Service, who says to his deputies, if something happened, this woman hasn't been promoted for eight years. What should we do? That person was Ambassador William Swing, who since passed away, but who coached me through the next level and steps of my career. I had to be open to that. I had to be willing to accept what I had done wrong and then move forward. And that's not easy for a lot of us. Um, the other is, I strongly say to young men and women, you select a mentor of someone who is in and of that sphere. Yes, if you're going into academia, you need a mentor to find out what tenure is all about. But if you're going into the foreign service, you really do need to meet men and women who have lived and walked that life and it's not as easy in the United States because unlike the military, which has bases around the country. So my advice to a young person was, even if you don't know someone who's been in the diplomatic service, if you have someone who's been in the military, they probably have interacted with diplomats. They may be able to help you understand what it is, what life is like being outside the country. I'll stop now because again, you have, at least I see 10 questions up there. And it's more important for us to answer them than to go on and on about our experiences. Very well, Ambassador Spratlin. Yes, um, I can just briefly say a couple of things. Uh, again, I wanna stick with uh, being in, inside yourself and your own skin mm -hmm. uh, as uh, an individual who is pursuing a career if you're interested in the foreign service and in diplomacy, um, that still is non-traditional for us, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I hope it, thanks to all the things, wonderful things that Howard is doing and other HBCUs, that this will not always be so, but um, we, uh, we still are living in a world in which we just don't have that many people mm -hmm. and our pipeline is not as robust as it needs to be. So two things, one is if you're in the foreign service and you're, you're, you're making your way, there are gonna be a lot of times when you and many other people come to doubt yourself for some of the reasons that you have heard uh, Ambassador Elon Thompson. You're often gonna be the only African-American person in the, the room. And you're gonna to go to the meeting after meeting after meeting where that's, that's so. So one of the challenges you may face is whether or not you're ready to move to the next phase. And I had an opportunity, um, um, an assistant secretary who was Richard Voucher, uh, one of the spokespeople for the State Department um, in his time. And he asked me to become the, the acting deputy assistant secretary for a while. And I was really quite stunned. I didn't expect to be asked that. And so I had to go to a mentor. I went to Ambassador Beth Jones and I said, what do you think? And she said, um, well, I don't think any man would hesitate for a second. You're ready, go, of course you should do this. So um, sometimes you need to have that affirmation. And this is another reason why mentors are so important. Um, you should be confident in yourself, but if you need support, this is again, I think the importance of support everywhere. Um, I, I think it's important to have those people who can affirm and say, of course, go for it. And this is especially true for women, I think but for, um, for African-Americans or people who have been traditionally uh, outside the system. The other thing uh, that can be challenging is that we're all in this country moving at different speeds in terms of our readiness to accept black leadership. We saw that with President Obama. We're seeing that now with um, Vice President Harris. Uh, and we, that, that same effect trickles down to institutions like the State Department and other institutions people in the majority group who do not want to accept your leadership. They don't want to accept your decisions. And this can show up lots of different ways. And I had this happen. And so being able to establish your authority, being able to establish your leadership and help people understand that your decisions will hold and let them keep their humanity at the same time. Um, that, is, that is something that it's a skill everyone is going to have to learn. And here I appreciate um, Ambassador Ruth Davis, who's really done so much for leadership development uh, for the State Department as a whole, and certainly for African-Americans. And I remember the senior seminar was no more by the time I got into the senior foreign civil service, but it had been replaced with a stripped down version called the um, SETS course, uh, senior, I don't know what all the other initials were. But one of the things Ruth Davis said was, um, you are gonna have to keep growing. 
because the skills you are bringing to this amazing point in your career where you've been chosen to enter that special group of the senior foreign service, they're not adequate to what you're gonna to need to do in the future. So you're going to need to develop new skills. And I kept that in mind as I was trying to find ways to deal with this challenge of not having leadership um, accepted. But it is, I think, something that you may face if you, uh, especially as you move up and you become more senior. In the early years when uh, most of the people that you're working with are colleagues and you're working with local staff, it can also happen with, with local staff. Uh, but I think that uh, it's more your colleagues who are Americans that can create that challenge for you. So it's an important lesson to figure out what your leadership style is and how you're going to navigate those moments when uh, your leadership is not uh, ac accepted. So, um, and I, there are many, many highlights from my career. I was very proud of uh, a number of different things that I was able to do. But again, uh, since our time is limited, why don't we just, uh, I'll turn the floor back over to you, Tania, and we can, if there's time, I'll go back to some career highlights. Wonderful. I'm going to skip to the questions in uh, the chat. Um, and <clears throat> since we're, we're kind of talking about this already, I'll go to one that might be quick um, from Paris Brown. Do these experiences ever make you feel discouraged in your field of work, and how do you keep going? Pamela, just... Yes, well, of course you feel discouraged. I mean, all kinds of things happen that make you feel discouraged. But again, why are you there? Why are you knowing, being anchored in that sense of purpose about what you're trying to accomplish helps a great deal. Again, the support system, again, the mentors, these are the things that really do um, to help you. They're, they're really gonna help you. And also remembering that you're in an extraordinary situation. Um, you know, the United States is the most powerful country in the world. So when you are represented, it doesn't matter what your position is. On some level, everybody is an ambassador for America. Yes. Even the tourists who show up, you know, so whether we like it or not. And so um, remembering that, that you have this opportunity to, and that's a kind of abstract concept if you're having a low day. But again, I think going back to your journal, figuring out, you know, what is it that's, that's really uh, at stake here for you? How is this helping you? And again, using your support system and any other form of help you need to keep yourself, um, to keep yourself healthy, working out, you know, eating well. I mean, you're in a lot of countries where maybe the diet doesn't lend itself to all the wonderful stuff you would get at Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or wherever you go. Um, but figuring out some way to keep yourself healthy and also um, knowing what your boundaries are and being able to, to preserve those. And if you need, there are, there are definitely opportunities to do this. If you need to take a break, take one um, on leave without pay and all kinds of things that you can do. But the most important thing I think is to find supports while you're in po at post or while you're in your job in the United States, whatever it is you need so that you can maintain your sense of balance as a human being. That's very, very important, I think, no matter where you are in your, your career. But that's what kept me going, knowing why I was there and tapping into my support system. Over to you, Ambassador Elam Thomas. I would second everything that you've said and go back to your first comment about this country is not ready for people of color to be in leadership positions. And that, no matter how we try to frame it, isn't going to change in the next five, 10 minutes uh, or in the next year. And you do find allies and you do have to, I, I really like your comment, Pamela, about knowing yourself, because if you don't have that sense of self, which I don't think I had until maybe 10, 15 years ago, because I just said, nobody else is going to define who I am, you know, I would preach it to others. It's a very different thing when you, you, you look at individuals who recognize you in that meeting room, but when you leave that room, you disappear. What I'm saying is that that happened so many times to me in the Department of State and in USIA that I began to wonder, am I invisible? I'm not in the meeting any longer. But there were a few people like Bill Burns, now head of the CIA, who always remembered my name if he saw me in the metro in Washington, D.C., that kind of thing. But that hurts. That hurts. Or if you make a presentation that you know is something that is what they need, 
and it's looked upon with less than credibility. And then three or four days later, you find that somebody else, this happens in the boardroom. Then you have to be strong as Pamela said, and know who you are and whose do you are. You'll have bosses who will say, oh, but why can't we try this? I said, because it's not legal. And as long as I'm in this job where I have to sign off on a government document, that is not going to happen. Now that's the person writing my evaluation report. And I counted that not twice, but three times in the four years I was in Greece. He's no longer with us, so I feel comfortable in saying. And I've told others he's the only person that I did not invite to my swearing in because I didn't have respect for that person who had no sense of integrity, but didn't look like us and could use the system. So that still exists. Yes, it does. Wow. Um, I have a question here from one of our Patricia Roberts Harris fellows, Catherine Gilliard. She wants okay. to know, um, she's interested in a career in public affairs and inter international development. And um, she wants to know what are some of the ways you've been surprised by what you thought you wanted or what you thought you knew and what you found once you were in the field? How did you navigate the perspective shift while still showing up for those core dreams and goals? Mm -hmm. Whoever wants to go first. I'm gonna to defer to Pamela. Well, so. you know, it's interesting. I, I'm, it's a great question. Um, uh, you know, about what happens when there, there's kind of a shift. Um, I would say the shift tended, though, to go in the direction of positive things, although not, not, not necessarily always. Um, I would say that, you know, I was ready for anything. So I didn't necessarily feel like, well, this is what I expect. So it didn't end up you know, when I went to the Russian Federation, it's a brand new country for me. I have no idea what I'm going to find there. How are people going to behave? How are they going to treat me? I don't know. Um, so I just kept my eyes open and just kept moving. So I'm trying to think of an example of the counter case where I had a pretty, well, actually, I'll give you one. And it's going to be a surprise to people. Um, when I went to Paris, I was assigned to Paris and it was my dream job. The ambassador was political and he had selected me over a hundred people. And uh, this was not at our embassy in Paris. This was at the US mission to the OECD. So I, you know, I told you already that I had started learning French as a little kid. I loved France and I just thought it was just gonna be awesome to be there. When I arrived in 1995, France was in turmoil. Um, a Canadian newlywed couple was killed in the uh, suburban train system, the RER, with a bomb explosion. There were bombs on the Champs-Élysées. There were strikes everywhere. I had, uh, I had taken, uh, made a decision to try to improve my French, and I, my French teacher was a French man from Algeria. And uh, when the strikes were happening and you couldn't, there was no public transportation, I had no way to get to his class. And so I tried to get my money back like a good American consumer. And he basically told me that was my problem. And so I made sure not to miss a single class because I was so angry. The gray buildings of Paris in November, I wasn't ready for, they were beautiful, they were fabulous, but they were so depressing. Mm -hmm. And with all the political turmoil that was going on, I did seriously consider curtailing that assignment. Even though it was my dream job and the place I had all, I've always wanted to go, the work was extremely intense and very, very difficult. Um, and, you know, not intellectually hard, but just that there was so much of it, all these meetings taking place. This was the time of the Asian financial crisis. So um, it was it was very, very difficult. And, and a time when the thing that I had always wanted just came crashing down. But again, I go back to friends. I had a Dutch friend who was in that same French class with me and we're still friends to this day. And he drove me nuts, but he called me every single night. And those calls, he has a great sense of humor, were what got me through the winter. So I ended up staying for my full three-year tour 
And it was, we had a lovely DCM at the time, Deputy Chief of Mission, she was wonderful. Um, I developed some friendships and I'm friends with many of those people today, uh, African-American women in Paris. <laughs> Harriet knows some of those same people. And so that is what got me through. Again, reaching um, deep into myself, using the network, using the support system, that is what got me through. But it's hard when you come and you expect something to happen and it's completely different from what you expected. Uh, fortunately, I was able to recover that, um, able to get the work more or less under control, but more than anything, to find a way to really connect back to why I wanted to be in Paris and make that tour uh, really work. So again, you're an African-American, you're resourceful. You know, I don't want to stereotype anybody, but you're used to having to make your way under circumstances that you might not expect. So whatever those skills are that you have in doing that where you are, you're going to need to sharpen those and develop them and use them in a career in the Foreign Service. So I'll stop there. I think you should go to the next question. Okay, we'll do that. Um, I'm so, there's so many good questions. It's so hard to pick, pick them on the fly. So I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm pretty sure we're not going to get to all of them. But let's see. Um, there's a question here about what, from Maya Hatchett, where do you see opportunities for the future of Black women diplomats in the State Department? Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. That's my one word that I'll say. Yep. As long as there are more women in leadership positions of any hue, the tendency is to hire those who make you, who look like you, your gender. So if you're in the room where it happens, I think that uh, we have reason to be optimistic. You know, so I had a little question. Yes, you had a hesitation in your voice. You know, what I would say is there's no question that it's going to be difficult. As I said before, we had GAO reports in 1989 and 2020 that basically talked about barriers, okay? We're still talking about the same thing. But we have now in Ambassador Gina Abercrombie, Wynne Stanley, somebody who is standing watch over this situation every day. And not only standing watch over it, but trying to make inroads. Um, you, Ambassador Elam Thomas, participated in a program yesterday in which the secretary once again reiterated his commitment to work on this um, issue. Um, so there will still continue to be uh, lots and lots of problems. And the challenge is that some of those problems are, are are areas that are subject to identification by numbers. Let's figure out how many of this, that, or the other we have and what the barriers are. But some of it, when it comes to the human being, has to do with our, our impressions, our perceptions, our ideas that are completely um, unspoken and not measurable. And those kinds of barriers and biases will affect us and will create challenges for us. And not just us, but other people too. Another challenge we will face is that the diversity that, that was talked about in 1989, which I would say was basically black and white, is not the diversity of today, which includes so many other people, which is great. We need a foreign service that does reflect America. And that means everybody. Um, but for me, the bellwether is where are the black people? And if I don't see any, then the, the, the the feeling is that this is still really just too high a hill to climb. But I would still say, just as if anybody has not seen the American Diplomat on American Experience PBS, please go and see that because you will see three men, Ambassador Edward Dudley, Ambassador Carl Rowan and Ambassador Terrence Todman, who were early, early pioneers when there was no space for black people and they made a way. And so that's why I say that it doesn't matter where you are, there is going to be a way for African-American women, black women, women of color to be everywhere. It's just a matter of time and how the fight actually goes and it will be a struggle um, as Frederick Douglass told us long, long ago. And so we just need to remember what is it, what is your North Star? What do you wanna do? Um, for Edward Dudley, for Carl Rowan, and for Terrence Todman, they knew what they were there for. They, were, they knew what they were there to do. You need to do the same thing, and then we can be everywhere as well we should. Okay, yes, I, in spite of the challenges. So sorry. Um, there, there are two, there are a couple questions here about um, kind of your thoughts on 
entering this field a little bit later in life. Uh, there's one question about uh, aspirations um, to enter international affairs in in the late in their late 30s. Um, and then there's another question from one of my colleagues here at the Bunch Center who is um, asking a similar question about what fueled, in particular Ambassador Spratlin, your motivation to continue to pursue a career after it was delayed for many years, as you described. How do you overcome your doubts and worries, if any, and, and what would you say to your 1990s self? So both of you, you want know, to... I, I would say what I said, go for it. I was 30 years old when I saw that man shuffling down the hallway in the state capitol in Sacramento, California. I didn't join the Foreign Service until I was 35 years old. So, um, you know, and I still had a career that lasted just a few months shy of 30 years. So my, and, and in my, the, the sort of boot camp for the Foreign Service, it's called something different now, but it was A100 at the time. And in my class, there was one person who was 40. She had been living as a professor in Paris for many years and joined the Foreign Service. And there was another gentleman who was, I think, 53. And each of them served for a few years. And then when I got to Moscow, there was a woman who was serving as a personal assistant to the section director who had been with United Airlines as a flight attendant. Uh, and she joined at 60. She joined uh, the Foreign Service at 60 because she had, uh, I think her partner had passed away. Um, she knew she was going to be by herself. She said, let me, I, with the airline industry, I don't have a fear flying, so let me go. So you can take the Foreign Service exam for many, many years. Um, you don't, you, you really just need to take the exam and go for it if it's what you want to do and not let things like age get in your way. But I think you also need to be thinking are my opportunities gonna be the same as a 23 year old coming out of Georgetown um, or Tufts or wherever? Maybe, maybe not. But the key is, why are you there? You need to go to your own North Star internally and know what it is that you want. I would always say, go for it. What's the worst thing that's gonna happen if you take the foreign service exam and fail? You'll be in the same place that you were before. And you also need to remember that the State Department is but one place there are so many opportunities. Ambassador Elam Thomas and I were at Aspen, Colorado last September, meeting with fabulous, fabulous mid-career professionals um, in the NGO sector, in the public sector. Uh, and I was really so pleased by the diversity of experiences that they had had in the military, in the NGO sector, some in private corporations, some at the State Department. You, your generation has so many opportunities, so many different kinds of places you can work, not to do foreign policy for that, you need to be in the State Department, but to be in international affairs in general. So I would say find ways to talk to people who will help you think that, find that part of yourself that supports possibility and risk-taking and nurture that so that whatever, if it's age, if it's geography, whatever it is, the school you went to, you can find a way to minimize that as a personal barrier and go for the thing that you are dreaming about. Go for it. So we have just a couple minutes left here. So what I'm gonna ask each of you to do is maybe just offer a practical piece of advice and maybe, cause there is one question here or maybe two um, who uh, questions for mid-career people already. Mm -hmm. So if you could offer some practical advice, both for students who I know are, are logged on, but also some of these uh, mid-career professionals who are also joining us today, one piece of advice for each of them as we close. Do you wanna go? Um, yes. For the mid-careers, you would bring a wealth of knowledge and life experience that is so invaluable in our building relationships abroad. Now, when you're 23 and just finished grad school and you've studied all you think you know about the world, it's not the same as having lived a life of having navigated a world that has its ups and downs and puts you in a position you have to question what is really important. Um, that said, there is a significant value of moving into a career mid-level. What is an issue in the department is that we are not 
quite ready yet to open the doors to people who have come in from another career and let them come in at that mid-level rank where they were in their private sector position. That is still being worked upon. And so it is going to be somewhat difficult to be 50 or 60 in that A100 class. Um, let's just be honest with ourselves. Yeah. I've had students in my class who were 18 and 19, and then others who were 28 and 29, who had been to war in, in, in Afghanistan. And they put these 18 and 19 year olds in their place in a nanosecond in a way that I couldn't because they had been out of the country and they had been in a war time situation. Um, for those who are new, let me stop here and let Pamela pick up on someone going into a career mid-level. I'll just be very quick and say that I was mid-level. I was 35 yeah. years old when I went into the, the foreign service. I got a piece of advice that was interesting and I think people need to turn it over their head in their minds. The gentleman who was helping me sort of navigate the entry process said to me, a white gentleman, who was an economic officer as I became, and he said, you know, you, at that time, State Department had a mid-level program and did allow yeah. people to come in mid-level. And he said to me, don't do it. He said, what will happen is that you will come in and you will always be seen as the one who was treated specially, yeah. the one who didn't pay your dues, the yeah. one who didn't, who isn't a true foreign service officer. Now, I had several people who were coming in with me. Uh, two of them were African-American, did come in mid-level. And I don't know, we haven't, I've never had a chance to talk to them, but I actually think it was a good piece of advice. I didn't come in mid-level. I did my consular tour. I started um, at the very beginning, even though it was starting over. And I think I did have less of that, oh, you're trying to be that special person kind of thing. I think this attitude uh, is a barrier to a lot of change that needs to happen in the State Department. But for me, that man's advice was useful. I took it and I think it helped me. So it just means if you're mid-level, you're making all kinds of choices. And that's just one of the, the choices that you're gonna have to make. Unfortunately, you won't formally get to come in mid-level. Um, as Ambassador Elam Thomas said, that's not an option right now. But I know there are many people advocating for it to go back to that and we'll see if it's possible. But again, you've got all those people racing up the system who were asked and ask, why do you get to come in midstream? It's like joining a marathon at mile 20, you know? That's how it's going to be perceived. So uh, you, you just have to think about it, weigh the pros and cons, and is it really worth it for you? Um, I, that's a choice I think only you can make. And then for young people, I would just say, again, both for really people of any age, if this is something you think you want to do, as it was when I was you know, in my early 30s, go for it. You don't wanna to get to be my age now and say, oh, I wish I had taken the foreign service exam. I wish I had given myself at least that opportunity. If you wanna do it, go for it. So over to you, Ambassador Yvonne Thomaston. I would close up for the young people. Close up for the young people and say, model yourselves on the characteristics we saw in the good nominee Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. And that was humility, a strong sense of self, respect and integrity. And it made my heart sing for every young person to just witness how she handled telling her life story very honestly. So that if you want this as a career and as Ambassador Spratlin says, and you know yourself, nothing should deter you from succeeding in reaching that goal. Understand that you are representing the most powerful nation in the world and how you carry yourself will be so important, people say to me. Oh, but I never see you. I don't own a pair of jeans. Yeah, I'm old. You cannot afford to go outside your door anywhere, even today, and, and be respected if you don't carry yourself in a certain fashion. So with that, know that it was one of the most gratifying experiences in my life to be a diplomat to represent America abroad, 
to do what I thought was the correct thing, not the uh, always the in thing and to be myself. So I thank all of you for having us here today. It is inspiring to see so many faces that look like us just on this screen. And we hope we will be able to help others come along. That's it. Because as long as we're on this planet, if we don't bring some with us, we need not be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all Thank you. so much. This was a fantastic conversation. I will uh, put a plug in for um, all the students listening now and recent graduates once again for the first for the summer enrichment Wrangell summer enrichment program that we run uh, for undergraduate students and then uh, for the Wrangell Pickering and Payne fellowships as Ambassador Spratlin mentioned that are celebrating anniversaries this year the 10th anniversary of the Payne fellowship for USAID the 20th anniversary of the Wrangell fellowship and the 30th anniversary of the Pickering fellowship for the State Department all of which are programs that will cover your master's degree and then feed you right into the Foreign Service. So all of those are run from here at the Bunch Center and you should please tune in later on as the year goes on because we will be having many events and, and um, convenings to celebrate those anniversaries and encourage those of you watching to consider applying if you are interested in a career in the Foreign Service. Um, with that, I will thank you both so much. Uh, I look forward to talking to you all again, hopefully, but thank you for taking the time today and I will pass it over to Dr. Dawumi. The students, oh, nice. So, so <laughs> thank you very much to our esteemed ambassadors for taking time to be with us on a virtual Howard University. And as you can see, my great students in Howard are waving and saying thank you for being with us. They've been watching on the screen. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Tashni Andubroy, who had to leave for giving us the remarks from the university. It's important to have buy-in from our leaders, and we are very grateful that we have that. I would like to thank Ms. Tania Hope from the Bank Center for an excellent moderation, and of course, telling us all the great work that has been taking place at the Bank Center under your leadership. And as she rightly mentioned, the Bank Center is an important ally to the Center for Women, Gender, and Global Leadership, and there's a lot of work to be done. To all our panelists, thank you, uh, sorry, our audience, thank you for joining us. I would like to give a special plug to um, Ambassador Swani Hunt, who is a former U.S. Ambassador to Austria for supporting the work of the Center and serving on the advisory board. And I would also like to encourage everyone who has been with us today, please check out the website for the Center for Women, Gender and Global Leadership. Follow our social media handles, watch our YouTube videos, and of course, support the work we do through your donations, your time and your talent. We welcome you all to the table. Lastly, the many questions that we're not able to get to, that shows the importance of the research we are about to do at the center. A lot of questions need to be answered and we hope you will join us in our knowledge seeking and exposing some of these issues. So Ambassador Elam Thomas, Ambassador Spratlin, thank you very much. If I could speak Russian, Greek, or in which I can't, but I can speak Wolof. And so Ambassador Elam Thomas, I will say Jerry Jeff. On, the, on behalf of all the people of Senegal and on behalf of my students, we all say thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you all next time during our virtual event. Happy Women's History Month. Thank you all. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Oui. Merci. That's good. <laughs>